Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. We need to continue on our spooktacular adventure this October. This thing... I think you guys are gonna like it. This is one of the creepiest, strangest Les Pauls that I've seen show up on Reverb in a long time. And I saved it in my watch list because I thought it was really cool. I do know the guy that was selling it. He watches the show. And it had a lot of elements that I liked about this thing. And I thought, hey, his price really is not that bad for what this thing is. But then he ended up reaching out to me because sometimes he needs help with international shipping. And I'll help him because I kind of know him. So I know he's not shipping illegal drugs out of the country using my name and whatnot. So when he reached out to me to ask me if I could help him with that whole international shipping because he had a buyer that was interested in it. After I said yes, he was like, okay, if I don't get a better offer within 24 hours, I'll go ahead and do that and let you know. And that's when I said, what's his offer? So he said it was X amount of dollars and I was like, I'll match that. And he was like, okay, yeah, I totally want to see this guitar get documented on the show anyways. But all I've got to say, guys, is get ready for a spooktacular informational journey on a very early piece of Gibson Early Custom Shop one-off beauty. I'm excited to see this thing. Let's go ahead and open it up. Oh, man. <laughs> I love it. It's, it's so strange. And... It's rooted in so many different models, like, it's gonna take a long time to explain exactly what this Egyptian beast is. Okay, so this was produced circa 1999. The Gibson Custom Shop is pretty new at this point in time. It was first introduced in late 1993, and in 1997, they expanded their operations. And this is about the point in time when Gibson starts to experiment with models doing custom finishes, doing chambering, and things like that. So, let's take a quick sidestep here. The Les Paul Catalina. That series has a couple of cool colors. There's a rare black pearl, you've got the Riverside Red that I documented a couple of Christmases ago, and all these other guys right here. As far as I'm aware, that is the first model within the custom shop to have some sort of a chambering weight relief. But then after that, you get the more popular Elegant series. The first two years, they have that big custom shop banner on their headstock. I documented one of those if you want to check it out too. But that's the one that everybody remembers as the first one. But within that series, there was also a gold flow and silver flow limited edition finish. And that's what this guitar has. Kind of, except for it's cooler. Like, this right here has a little bit more black in it than normal. So take a good look at this one, and now take a look at the few gold flow finishes that you can even find. You see how that's more of like a, a very light black streak in it, almost kind of a brown? Whereas this kind of has like Joe Perry Boneyard vibes to it, right? But I can tell just by holding this thing, I think the best way to describe this guitar would literally be a 1P90 Rap Tail Les Paul Elegant Gold Flow. But th that's not even the half of it yet. So then we get to move on to this. Okay, so the 1P90 and 1 Humbucker Customs, most famous because it birthed the old glory of Jared James Nichols, right? Those were birthed around like 2010. Before that point, you don't really see too many full-on Les Pauls just get one pickup like a junior. So that was the first thing that really made me intrigued by this thing because you just don't see that too often, like hardly ever. But it's got the Les Paul Junior layout right here, so it's just master volume, master tone. It's definitely been weight relieved. I'm pretty sure this is just going to be like the Les Paul Elegance and it's got that finish. So I think that pretty well covers the body, right? But now we need to move on to this fretboard. It's like <laughs> abalone side marker inlay. Oh, okay. You don't see that too often on a Les Paul. But this one, ebony fretboard with the fret nibs and no inlays. 
<laughs> it just adds to the rarity of this thing. I am just dumbfounded at all the custom specs on this thing. Unmarkered fretboards, you, you just don't see that too often. So it's kind of got some like bucket head specs. And now get this, it's even a baritone. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's too far. It's not a baritone. I think it's regular scale length here. But you get to the headstock. The reason why I brought up that custom shop Les Paul Elegant version one is this was done in 1999 and that's the first year that they stopped doing that for the Elegant. So that would have been one more spec that would have really took this thing off the charts as being crazy. But let's face it, most people prefer the regular Gibson headstock overlay anyways. And then, then we get to the back here. It's just natural. What would have been really crazy is if it would have just had the oblong backplate back here like a Les Paul Jr. has, but no, it's got the full-on Les Paul backplate. But it appears to be a single piece of nice mahogany back here, good wood grain, some light figuring when you move it in the light, but nothing, you know, too crazy. This definitely looks like a early 90s wood. You can kind of see some of the, I think that's pore filler that's under the finish, even though it kind of looks a little bit weird. So... I'll be honest with you guys. At first, I was like, yeah, it's cool, but I don't know if I could put my seal of approval as this being original until I would have it in my hands. So that's why when the opportunity arose to document this thing, I knew I needed to do it. So far, it seems to be everything that he said it was. It's got so much history. I mean, you guys know I like my 1P90 wrap tail Les Pauls that are full on with the maple tops because of like the Kazuyoshi Saito Les Pauls. And to make matters even worse, this isn't actually even a P90. <laughs> I'll save that for the workbench though. We need something to talk about then. So I asked him, what is the story behind this? Because as I was telling you, I was, a, I was a little bit worried. Like a lot of this makes sense for the time period, but somebody could just retop it or put a veneer over a regular Les Paul and refinish it in this. But he said he got this from a band's manager, that band being Winona. And that band manager got this at a tour of the Gibson plant. So I thought, hey, cool, maybe I'll call Gibson and see just maybe, just maybe if they have any records of this guitar. And I called him up, super friendly guy. He told me, no, Gibson has no records of this guitar. It's fake. Nah, no, just kidding. He didn't tell me it was fake. He said, Gibson only keeps records of guitars that end up going to dealers. So a guitar that just left the factory directly and never made it to a dealer, like for an artist or a manager or something like that. He said, it totally makes sense why this thing did not show up in their little shipping ledgers. Because you also have to remember this predates you know those beautiful coas that we know and love today i mean we're just barely getting into the period where they do the big large paper ones that everybody lost but at least we do have uh one of the warranty cards for this one it's definitely been used it's got some water stains on it so in here it says custom lp l body maybe bod I don't know if that's a Y, a sideways T, but it has the serial number as CS9891, and that matches what's on the back of the headstock, so that's that's as close as we're going to get. Made 12-20-1999, which also matches what the serial number would say. So it's got that going for it. So far, everything feels right to me. It's very similar to that silver flow and the fact that this is the gold flow like those silver ones they always get the finish checking but this one it's not quite as metallic as that so maybe they changed that so they didn't get so much finish checking if you want to check out another cool early 2000s guitar that has a very similar vibe to this one i had a snakeskin gold top once I wish I would have kept that guitar because it was so unique. The only way I could describe it was snakeskin. I hope you're enjoying seeing that on the screen. But it kind of reminds me of this guitar and they were birthed around the same time. But a fun story, the guy who used to own this, he actually showed it to Joe Perry and because he was curious if he had anything to do with it because it's also similar to like his Gold Rush Les Paul that just came out. And apparently he said, no, I had nothing to do with that. But man, that's a cool guitar. The only thing left to do is to throw this thing on the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs. So far, everything feels right to me. It arrives safely. It just needs a little bit of a cleanup job, and I think we will be good to go for documenting this really cool piece.
Well, my friends, I think I found myself a keeper here. This is such a cool guitar. Like when I got it, it was dirty, like not so dirty you didn't want to touch it, but after polishing, wow, this whole finish just, it sings in a whole different light now. Like you can definitely tell the metallic nature of the paint, how it gets really dark at the side and really bright straight on. It just needed a little bit of light TLC to really show its true colors here. And I think we can all agree here, this should have had a black B90 cover on it because it brings out the black, pops the fretboard. Now, to be fair, putting this on here, that pops the binding, but it makes it look too nice. So I think I'll get a black P90 cover for this because I'm gonna dub this one the mummy because for obvious reasons. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and dive in here. First off, what is it with me getting cheated out of P100 humless P90 pickups all the time? Happened on that Berries and Cream Les Paul special. Gibson did send me one, but this was advertised to me as a, a, a P100. It's, it's not. I'm not upset about it because I prefer a regular P90, but yeah, it's just a regular P90 in here. It would have been cool to have a P100 because it's a period strange thing, but that's what those things look like. They have two layers. They're stacked on top of each other, and that kills the hum of the P90. Whereas this guy, he's just a single layer here. But here's what the back of this one looks like. It almost matches the gold flow finish. It's kind of caved out. I've never seen that on Gibsons before, but then again, I'm not sure if I've ever had a 90s P90. In a long time anyways, but you've got the gold pole pieces there. But let's go ahead and take a look at our pickup cavity. So we've got two foam blocks, that looks right. You've got the gold flow finish in the areas that you should see it and not in the others. So you can see the mahogany, a little bit of the maple cap still right here because this is a very, very shallow route right here. And that's normally how they do these things so you don't have to have a bunch of springs and whatnot. Then if you get in here, you can get inside the mahogany body. This does indeed have the elegance chambering system. So you can see how that just continues on in there. Now what's unique about the elegance chambering as compared to like the 2007 style that they used in Gibson USA is all the chambers are connected. Here you can see a diagram that shows you this chambering system. So if this had a toggle switch, you could drop something in there and it would fall out your back plate there. All right, I decided to grab my endoscope to show you what I'm talking about here. Right here, what you're seeing is actually the bridge P90 cavity route. Now normally an elegant would have another pickup all the way up here, but this one does not have that. So this is technically even different from a regular Les Paul elegant in that aspect. And that fact also gives me a lot of confidence that this left the factory like this. But right here, what you're seeing is the bump in the bottom of the body where the strap button gets drilled into. Then that's just the edge of the body. And then that curves around this little post right in here that goes around to where the toggle switch would be if we had one. So just to show you that one more time. So all carved out here and all in there. And then they just have like a little block right in here that everything gets drilled into. So that's actually really cool to see. I'm actually glad to see that that did not have a neck pickup route in it at all. Cause if it did, this probably started life as, you know, an actual elegant or they just took a body off the line. This tells me it was actually custom ordered like this, or they just decided to get freaky for some reason. Nothing strikes me as suspiciously odd on this very odd guitar. So even if you've tried a chambered guitar and you didn't like it, there are different styles of chambering within Gibson's history. But as far as our reading, that is 7.85K ohms. That also tells me it's a regular P90. Those other ones read twice as much. Very cool. Time to move on to our lightning bar wrap tail piece. So we've got two studs in the body. And after cleaning this, this looks great. The lightning bar is to help with intonation, but otherwise you have to use these little screws right here to go back and forth and just get it the best you can. Right there, you can see the branding codes on here. Then another one right in there. And as far as our control layout, very simple. Master volume, master tone, as you would expect. Now, as far as the condition, the original owner of this, when they got it, they didn't play it a lot. They had it on stage a few times and played it here and there, but they ended up deciding they didn't want to tour with this really expensive guitar or play it out too much. But th there are some nicks and dings, like right here underneath the tailpiece, you can see like an impression. And then over here, it's kind of hard to see, but it does show its head occasionally right there. Other than that, on the front anyways, this thing really hides any type of scratches or other blemishes because 
it's just a unique finish. Like, I feel Gibson could sell these yet today. I know the silver flows get the, uh, the finish checking, which can kind of look ugly to some guys, but yeah, this thing really shows off its carved top when you get it into light. But moving on from the chambered out mahogany body and maple top, we have a mahogany neck with a straight up ebony fretboard. Now what I'm really curious about is a little known fact about the original Les Paul Elegance that I never even covered in any of my videos on them, because I just didn't know. They have a compound fretboard radius, I believe it's 10 to 14 inches, instead of the regular 12 inch radius, so I'm going to go ahead and check that now. So let's see here, at the first fret, yeah, that seems to line up, 10. Then maybe a little bit flatter by like the fifth or so. But you can just barely tell that 12 is not quite enough at the 12th fret. It definitely does go to the 14. So yeah, it's got the Elegance compound fretboard radius. It's just one of those little known specs. Like I, I didn't even know that was a thing back then when I was documenting guitars. But now I'm a little bit older and wiser. But anyways, 22 medium jumbo frets. There you can take a peek at those abalone side marker inlays because that's all you got. You don't have any inlays on this beautiful ebony board and it is all bound. So let's go ahead and see if they messed with any other specs. Do we have a fender scale length? No, nah, looks like 24 and three quarter inches to me. You know what's strange? Fender measures their scale lengths from the edge of the nut. Gibson measures theirs from the middle of the nut I found, which is strange. So if anybody knows the reasoning behind that, please let me know. But we've got a nut width of 1.7 inches. That increases to 2.05 by the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.82. And that increases to 0.97 by the 12th. Here's that profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. Definitely a C shape. It's like a rounded C shaped neck profile. It's not overly chunky, like it doesn't completely fill your hand, but it's definitely more of a rounded neck. So I would say somewhere in between a 50s and 60s, kind of like the elegants are. But here you can really see those Apollone side markers. But now we move on to the face of the headstock, looking nice and clean now. Our truss rod doesn't look like it's ever been adjusted. You wanna know how I know? If you look right here, you can see part of the truss rod nut has been shaved down. That used to happen a lot when they were planing the headstock down. They would accidentally grab the truss rod nut if it was sitting a bit too proud. So that's kind of funny to still see that there. But the cover itself, it's just completely blank. It's just your regular one. And it has our Les Paul model silk screen as well as the Gibson Mother of Pearl logo. Now this looks to me like the lacquer's bubbling just a little bit in a few locations. After I polished it, that's when that kind of showed up. It's either that or I didn't do good enough of a job polishing, but that does happen occasionally. Cause I can't seem to rub that away like I can with some of these other small marks. And something else I found after polishing this, at one point in time, somebody left a tuner on the headstock for a long period of time. And that's what happens, that those rubber grippers on them, it'll impress the finish. So that was probably left like that in the case or on a stand somewhere. Thankfully, you really have to be looking for that, but that is the curse of the mummy right there. Moving on to the backside here. I guess what you guys really wanna see is right in here. So this has a Gibson branded pot as the volume and like the regular CTS style in the bridge. I believe this is when they start transitioning into the Gibson branded pots. So that could very well be original. It could also be replaced. It's honestly so hard to find photos of other elegants. A lot of them have this style, which I wish was still used because, you know, 137, that tells you it's a CTS pot. Then 97, that tells you the year of production, 1997. And then 50 something. So that was a very late 1997 pot. Whereas these Gibson ones, you, you can't date them like that, unfortunately. But what is nice is we can actually see through to the maple top. It's got some light figuring to it, nothing too crazy. But you can also see the clear finish. So based off of everything I've seen in this, I see no evidence of this actually being a refinish or a reworked guitar. So I'm completely happy with what I've seen. But in the late 90s, early 2000s, sometimes you can find beautifully figured mahogany. Like we're talking actual flame and quilted backs. Unfortunately, this one doesn't have that, but it is gorgeous. Like it's got some nice stuff. There's a few nicks and dings on the edges. Another one like right there. But this is nice wood, like a lot of dark streaks in it too. Kind of matches the top in that aspect. Sure, they got a little bit crazy with the poor filler, especially on the bottom right here, but eh, whatever. And the output jack plate is plastic. Still not cracked. Everything needed tightened up. I don't think this thing's been played in probably a good 10, 20 years. 
But one last thing before we move on from the body, it does have the wide binding in the cutaway. So it's not like historic spec stuff here. We don't have the maple cap exposed. Now moving up the neck, beautiful. Just nice mahogany color. Now it's not shipping damage or anything, but you can see some like lacquer cracking along the binding. That's common. And this is a very mild case. That normally just happens because the binding and the wood, they expand and contract at different times. And sometimes there's like a, a little crack where you can feel a ridge. You can kind of feel a small ridge right there. So that tells me this thing was well taken care of all of its life. We've got a beautiful custom shop Gibson decal on the back. Gibson Deluxe Cluson Tuners. I cleaned the uh, backside of them because they were looking a bit aged, but I didn't clean the edges. So you kind of got a, a cool mix between aged gold and gold gold. And our serial number, Custom Shop 9891. When I called Gibson, they're like, is that all? <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's a 1999. They didn't need too many digits. So to read these, four digits put you in the 90s. So nine put you to 99. And ah. Oh, there is a small little ding on the corner right here. It was used, but certainly not abused. Well preserved for the afterlife. Very important to do a black light test on a guitar like this. So far, everything is looking good on this one, glowing the way I would expect to see a late 90s one glow anyways. Even our binding on this one, that's pretty cool. Headstock looking pretty good. And then we can also flip it over to the back here. That is glowing evenly which is nice after our last surprise on that Black Beauty 82. Looks like maybe a small scuff mark right there. But everything on this one is looking good. Okay, there we go. I figured we would see some sort of a stand rash on here. So it's right there. Is there one on the very bottom? Yep, you can see a very small one right there. And right there. So that makes complete sense how we saw that little impression on the top right there. This just sat on someone's stand. It was like a, a nice light at home player type thing. No breaks, cracks, or repairs on our headstock here. And even our tuner tips are glowing. That's pretty cool. Sometimes impressions will glow differently, but no, that one must have had nitro safe rubber, but it still left an impression. Very cool. Everything checks out on this one, guys. You thought I was kidding. I'm leaving that cover off. I love the way it looks so rustic without that cover. And the wraps over the windings really pull off that whole mummy vibe that I'm going for on this one. Wow, night and day fantastic. I'm loving this thing. Eight pounds, 2.3 ounces, pretty light for a Les Paul. Let's go ahead, plug it in and hear how the mummy sounds. All right, let's go ahead and get to the playing demo. It's just one pickup, so I don't need to talk you through it. I might mess with the tone occasionally, but let's just get to it. Also note where I'm picking. Like if you pick up here, sounds different than down here. I mean, that's true for every guitar, but very true for a one pickup one. I like that, it has a really throaty hollow sound. Overall, I would say very nice clean tones. I'm noticing this is a very resonant guitar. Like it's so lightweight. It's not neck heavy. I could play this on stage all night long. This is just the perfect weight for a Les Paul. I really do like the elegant chambering style on these guys and match that with this really cool mummy gold flow finish. Yeah, I'm, I'm really digging this thing. <laughs> 
of course, now we need to kick on some distortion to see what this baby can really do. <laughs> Now that we know all about this weird gold flow elegant mummy guitar, I guess we can call it. What are my final thoughts on this thing? Oh man, I'm sorry. If you wanted to buy this, I'm not selling it. Like, I mean, if you want to strong arm it from me for $15,000, okay, I'll sell it then. But otherwise, yeah, this is going into my museum collection. This is just, it's too cool to let go. I mean, especially when I put a black cover on it. I would not suggest playing a P90 uncovered simply because it's not comfortable. You get these sharp edges right here. There's a reason you put a cover on these things, but it looks too cool to have a cream cover on it. The only thing I would change about this guitar is I wish it had the Kazuyoshi Saito access heel joint because it's pretty much that guitar again, but lighter in weight and just, you know, a little bit fancier looking, I guess you could say. That's the only thing I found myself kind of missing. But then again, I don't get up here that often. It's just more so the bragging rights of, yeah, I've got the access heel join. And the only other thing that I think would look cool on this one is the nut should be brass because then it would match very well with this finish. You would have this whole gold thing going out. Because now that I don't have that cream covered P90 on here, you know, it just looks out of place being so white, whereas everything else is either like an aged binding color like this one, or the slightly aged tuning tips. This is a fantastic guitar. It definitely doesn't feel or play like any other Elegant that I've had before. I mean, those are nice guitars too, but this thing, it's just something completely on its own. It has so many references to other models that were being built at this time that have now become collectible and hard to find, sought after, whatever you want to say. And then there's the other guys that's like, hey, it's 
It's a one pickup guitar. You don't have a bunch of options, but you got enough if you know how to get it out of the guitar. So troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed your spooky special today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you guys tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. As always, if you're interested in being the next owner of one of these demo guitars, you can check them out on my website, troglysguitarshow.com. There's some links in the description.